People around the world recognize the Liberty Bell as a symbol of freedom, but do you know why it was created? Let freedom ring as I prepare Cocovar Rouge, Herb Spätzle, Belgian Undive Dore, and Chad Raw. In honor of this great symbol of American freedom, join me for a taste of history. We take the Liberty Bell so many times for granted, but it's indeed an icon of freedom the world over. In honor of this great symbol of American freedom, I'm getting ready to make some cocova, rouge, and my friend Kayla and Bruce are gonna bring me the chickens. Hey, Walter, yeah. you're making cocova. This dish I make is one of my favorite because growing up we grew our own chickens. There's two kinds of uh, cocova. There's one with the white sauce and there's one with the red sauce. You're pretty right, so which one, we gonna, which one are we going to take first? This guy you here? You can take that one first. All right, come yeah. over here. <laughs> 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 Kayla and Bruce left me their three chickens, and I'm sure they're happy to get their freedom. The recipe I'm doing is a cocova rouge, which is very different from a cocova blanc. Obviously, one uses white wine or Gewurztraminer or Riesling, and I'm using just red wine today. What makes the difference, this dish is a little more involved with advanced preparation because you want to marinate the chicken the day before. The wine penetrating the chicken and the herbs. In case you wonder, this is discolored, right you are, but it has been marinated in red wine overnight. What you want to do is just pat it dry with a paper towel like I'm doing here. Basically, all it needs is salt, because when I marinate meat, I never add salt to it. And the reason for that is, salt is a dehumidifier. When you make this recipe, please do me a favor and, and discard the marinade. While there are many recipes I know that tell you that you can use the marinade by boiling it, I feel safer if you just discard it. When I marinate it, basically the marinade is red wine, shallots, garlic, a good amount of herbs such as rosemary and thyme. Salt around it. I have a dutchie in the back getting warm. Add butter into it. Put it back on the fire quick to get some extra heat. While the butter is melting and getting hot, I'm just taking the chicken and drench it in the all purpose flour. Remember, it has all the herbs and spices penetrate the skin and the flesh, so it should be fantastic eating. For this particular recipe, you don't want to butter too hot, because what I want to do is want to slowly simmer it and get a nice little uh, flavor on there perfectly. Now, yeah. Once I have this on the fire, I'll then show you how to cut the chicken down, so if you want to do this recipe, you'll be able to uh, achieve the same success. And really what's happening now is this chicken is gonna be simmering there. And every time when it gets a little too warm, it gets deglazed with red wine. So it's a recipe that involves a good amount of uh, red wine. Pearl onions or baby onions, whatever you wanna call them. I happen to like the red ones, have more flavor into it. You get them in most Asian stores, not difficult to find. You just wanna peel them, add it in a small pot, a little salt into it and water and just poach it. Just to cover it with water, that's all it takes. It won't take long at all, it just needs a nice little blanch to it. While the chicken here is cooking away at high speed. Look at that, cautious. You don't want to burn it, because it can burn relatively quickly. I'm just gonna get a little bit more. A couple more times on the other side. Because the all-purpose flour will burn really quick. When you make this dish, you want to be careful. Like I said, it browns quickly. And you don't want too much color on it. Now would be a good time to put the garlic into it. 
and the shallots that are right here already pre-chopped. Now go back on the fire again because you want the shallots and the garlic to be able to sweat a little bit down with the butter. I'm going to chop some onion quick, real coarse. There's two kinds of onions in the kokova that I make. One is the pearl onions and the other ones are regular white onions I'll chop really quickly and real coarse. The flavor of the onion that goes in it for uh, sauteing is different from the onion that I ate into it as pearl onion. The pearl onion is in this mostly almost like a garnish, where this one enhances the flavor of the kokova. I'm deglazing the first time. And I will do this a couple more times. I got some thyme already pulled. The ladons are pre-cooked. Why? Because I want to make sure that some of the excess fat comes out of it, but the flavor still stays the same. And what the ladon is, basically, is a very beautiful salad smoked bacon. This happens to be upper wood smoked. Most people think bacon is raw. Bacon is never raw. <laughs> bacon is salt cured and then smoked. So it's not like you wonder about you're eating raw bacon. It's not at all. You can put the bacon in now, so it cooks down with the chicken, or you can put it later as a separate step like I have here. So I'm going to put some of the bacon in now. Beautiful. I want to show you quickly how you cut a chicken up. Now, this is not the chicken by the way so earlier. <laughs> this one I bought in a store. Take the, the feet off. This goes into the stock that is sitting behind me. Make sure the inside is clean and you have too much fat. You don't usually do this away. Too much fat would be used for rendering schmaltz. Goes into my stock. I want to make sure that I check, as I said earlier, this kokova is nothing to take lightly. So next I'm going to let it simmer for a little bit more until the onion gets more translucent. And then I'm going to add some chicken stock into it. And then later I'm going to add my mushrooms and my lardons and the chicken is done. Exceptionally in the last moment of blood. So now let's go back to the chicken. When you take the chicken it's really easy. You just want to go through it and just pull it off like so. Cut it in half over here. So basically you make eight pieces out of the chicken. One, two, and go over here. It's the same thing. You, you come right to the back and then you just pull it over and just follow the contour of the chicken down. When it comes to the breast, you just want to follow down on the breastbone like so. Go all the way down because you don't put it back into the chicken. Then you take that. There we go. You can, if you like to, put a little wing joint separately. Especially if you have kids, they like to eat them. This piece with the back does not go into the kokova. So I'm going to cut this. Here we go. You got eight pieces. Let me show you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then this one over here. And it goes right into the chicken stock. And the chicken stock that I already started earlier is then what goes into the kokova because too much wine would be too strong. So the chicken stock will give it a nice little flavor to it. There we go. The chicken I got to put here in the landing, I'm going to make two things I got to make sure. One, make sure it doesn't sit up, as I told you earlier with the flour. Second of all, I want to make sure that I check on salt and pepper. It doesn't need anything whatsoever. And second of all, I got to look at the chicken and see how much time it takes to finally to cook. And the way to do that is obviously very simple, not done yet. So if you both fingers can touch each other, then you're pretty much ahead. Now is a good time to add the lardons. I'm going to get the onions over. So when you poach them, you want to poach them so they're still al dente, but they're perfect. It's just, you can just actually eat them. Mm -hmm. Red wine. Good amount of pepper. Just crushed pepper. At this stage, in your home kitchen, you're going to make this recipe, it'll be a good time now just to do the whole pot in the oven at about 375, maybe 15 minutes, it will do it. The Liberty Bell is an icon of freedom the world over. In 1777, during British occupation of Philadelphia, 
All metal was collected to melt down to make cannonballs, including many of the church bells. The story of the Liberty Bell starts in 1751. For the 50th anniversary of William Penn's Pennsylvania Charter, a bell was commissioned to be cast in England and to reside in the State House steeple. That State House would later be known as Independence Hall. Upon its installation, the bell cracked on its first trial ringing. Over the next hundred years, the bell would be melted down and cast again several times in the hope of making it more robust and appealing to the ear. The bell was frequently rung to call Philadelphians to discuss the Stamp Act. In fact, Franklin says on one occasion that he had heard the bell ringing and he had to go to the State House to meet with the politics. In 1777, when British troops threatened to invade Philadelphia, all bells were taken down and rushed out of town. They were fearful that the British would use the bell and melt it down and, and make cannon out of that metal. Perhaps the most infamous ringing of the bell was in 1846, when it rang for the last time to commemorate George Washington's birthday. When this horrendous crack appeared, it was actually a hairline fracture that went almost up into the crown of the bell. At that time, it was silenced pretty much forever. It's the inscription on the bell that really makes it the icon that it is. Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. This quote originally summarized Penn's efforts at giving equality to all, and it was the ideal symbol in trying to end slavery in America. Women fighting for the right to vote paraded a replica of the Liberty Bell with the clapper silenced, vowing never to ring it until their fight was won. In 1920, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, it was rung in front of Independence Hall. The Bell's association with equality and liberty continues to modern times. Coretta Scott King established the tradition of gently tapping the Liberty Bell on Martin Luther King's birthday. The bell has come to symbolize America's expression of freedom. One of the side dishes I'm making right now is an herb spätzle. I'm doing this right now so you can see the side because it's got to rest up for a little bit. But I want to show you how it's done. It's all-purpose flour. I have a whole bunch of beautiful herbs. I have some chives, I have some parsley, I have some thyme chopped very, very fine. I put a little bit of salt into my flour. And some very important part of this recipe is the nutmeg. Nutmeg, lots of it. It would never work without nutmeg. Very important part of 18th century cooking, but even more so important, I'm making spätzle. So you got nutmeg. Now I crack a few eggs in there. Herbs, a bit of thyme. And most important is the chives gets a good flavor. And now I'm gonna mix it up. Can you use a, a kitchen machine for that? Absolutely. You just wanna stir it up. You have noticed I haven't put no water into it. And the reason this is important to know, because the eggs are never the same size. Even so I tell you to use uh, double A, it doesn't really matter. So I start off with the eggs and first start making the dough. And then later I adjust with water to get a dough for its right elasticity. Crack another egg in there. You can always add. You can never take away. It works in any recipe. So here we go. Another two eggs in it. And then comes the water. The spätzle dough has got to sit up for a while to be able to get the elasticity out of the gluten, scrape it into the boiling water. While this sits up, I'm going to show you my favorite of all vegetables, which is the Belgian endive doré. Belgian endive is one of my favorite vegetables, and most people look at me and say, well, isn't it just used for salad? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of forgotten art because it's also very complicated to make. You want to get a dutchie like I have over here? What do you think I have here in front of me? <laughs> a lot of fat, that's kidney fat. Like you may use for kidney, kidney pie. So the kidney fat, what I want to do, I'm going to slice some slices down, lay it on top like so. And a little bit of garlic, a little bit of shallot, a little bit of white wine. And now it goes on the fire. 
Depends how hot your fire is, 15, 20 minutes will do it until the andive is uh, planched. There we go. Look at that. You see how quick it came together? No smoke and mirror, right? There we go. And it blows bubbles. This is how you want it. And now what I'm going to do is I have my little spätzle board here. It's the same as any spätzle except that has herbs in it. It gives a unique flavor and actually works extremely well with the coco vin. Take my spatula, straighten it out to the front, and here we go. And put the right in there. And here we go again. Once they float, they're done. It's really quick. Look how fast the special went. It is so beautiful. Here we go. Now, when you serve them right away, you just take them out of the water and put them in a dish. If you serve them later, you want to shock them. Put them aside. And then when you get ready to serve your meal, you just reconstitute them quickly, some salt water. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful dish. Here we go. Oh, beautiful. So the Belgian andive has cooked slowly with the kidney fat on top. So I'll take it on my board and I'm going to squeeze them down. I'm saying the salt, pepper, flour. Now I have some egg wash over here. I'm going to put a good amount of all purpose flour. Egg wash. Now I've got my griddle hot over there. My meal is ready to be served up. The chicken is absolutely spectacular, and my Belgian andouille story, do I need to say more? Just perfect. Slow fire, gorgeous. So my cocoa is here. You have seen that I put no flour in there. The flour that's in there is a little bit of flour that was outside of the chicken before I sauteed it. Now I have some blood, and don't be shocked about it. Uh, <laughs> so this is having to be beef blood. Now, interesting with this recipe would be that once you put the blood in it and then mix it under, the expression of blood is thicker than water <laughs> because the blood will thicken up the dish, as you can see right here. What you want to do, don't put it back on the fire. If you put this back on the fire, it curl. Mm. Spectacular. Now, if you want to make this dish and you don't want to put blood, I think you're better off just putting a cornstarch slurry in it because that will not take away from the flavor. So here we go, look at that. Isn't that awesome? Oh, God. That is divine. Taste my cocova rouge. Oh. What can I describe it? Spectacular. Fantastic. The Liberty Bell is one of the precious artifacts to remind us on the American Revolution. And would you know there's actually someone that maintains the Liberty Bell and we call them the Keeper of the Bell. The National Park Service, operator of Independence National Park in Philadelphia, is responsible for the preservation and operation of some priceless icons of American history including Independence Hall and, of course, the Liberty Bell. For the past 30 years, Robert Giannini has been the keeper of the bell. I've been watching over this bell since 1972. Oh, it should be commended. It's yeah. quite an important icon of America. No? It sure is. We're protecting the objects here for the National Park Service and for the country and the world. I noticed that visitors are not allowed to touch the bell. Why is that? This is a venerable relic, and just like the other things that we have in our collections, we try to protect them the best we can. And so we often wear gloves and make sure that we're not transferring any chemicals from our hands onto the surface of the bell. The keeper of the bell, whose loving care preserves our nation's icon for generations to come. Shad and Shad Roe are very, very precious and very prized. Way back when, 
the 18th century and before then, when the shad comes inland and goes up to spawn, you know that pretty soon Easter would be here. The most present of the fish is the female, obviously, because it carries the roe. And the chad roe is so sought after, there's festivals, all kinds of things happening, but it's also very costly because you don't have many fish around. There's a female shad, about a normal size of a shad. Now, normally, depending how you're going to cook it, you want to uh, scale them. For the purpose today, we just want to talk about the roe. So what we're going to do is we're going to open this fish belly. And what you see here is what people go crazy over. Look at that. This is the road. Thousands and thousands of eggs are in there. Look at that. And this happens to be a really spectacular one. Look at that. Unique flavor because you have a million eggs, kind of like caviar, but the eggs are in there and it just gets sauteed. The real way you cook them is usually just in butter, maybe some capers, a little seasoning, and really, really quick. It's not a long thing. All you want to do is have a hot pan, which I have behind me. Depends what you got sometimes. You want to just take them apart here. Put them in my little uh, pan here. Hold on. I'm going to put some lemon juice in here. A little bit of uh, Leon Pear on the Worcestershire, so it's a little bit. A little bit of ketchup. Very little. Ketchup. 20 years, from Malaysia direct. All right, a little salt. And now comes the trick, the butter. Okay. So the chat is, is very sensitive. So all you wanna do, just turn it over like so. And like I said, you don't have to put capers in it. Most people put absolutely nothing in it. Just like that. And take some lime. Some lime over here. Lemon on the other side. You know, amazing things that happen in history. One of the things that really is a great story, when George Washington was president of the United States and lived in Philadelphia, the story goes that he had an important delegation from where I don't know exactly, I think it was Italy or Spain, that came over sometime this time of year, spring, and he told the Hercules to fix him some superb dinner. Hercules figured, okay, we'll do it, and went and got himself a shad. Now, when he served up the whole shad and the shad roe on the side, Washington knew how expensive the shad was. And he said, I'm not gonna eat the shad with my company, because this thing I'm gonna be wasting the new government's money. And sent the shad back in the kitchen. Well, guess who ate it? <laughs> They're cooks, however. So people normally eat this just by itself. There's very few dishes that you know have side dishes to it. As I said, it's an acquired taste, but it's beautiful, and people have been doing it as a tradition for centuries.